Um, so what happened was at 17, I had an assault and robbery charge. Now, whether it was as serious as the years made it sound to be or not, I don't know. Like all I just know is, you know, I decided to take matters into my own hands. I was tired of being poor, tired of being broke, tired of having two pairs of shoes, two pairs of jeans for the jeans school year, tired of having five shirts to rotate through, you know, and I had, I've always worked, always worked as a kid mm -hmm. since like 14, but it just wasn't enough. Like my family was still in the hood. We still was in dilapidated housing where I didn't even want to bring my friends. And I was tired of it. So I was like, uh -huh. I got to do something. I have to do something. And prior to getting arrested, I had just gotten into like the whole robbing thing. And I used to, my mm -hmm. targets was drug dealers. Um, and I was like, okay, I, I rationalized drug dealers. Cause I'm like, oh, they in the game. They not even like, I can't even see them as people. Like they, they just are targets. They targets that I should get. So I, I was rationalizing by that because me, I found out later that that wasn't even, I wasn't even about that. Like I really right. was a compassionate kid. I really was a loving kid but I let the environment dictate who I was versus my efforts. Hey, it's your imaginary best friend, Finch. And I know at times life can seem hard and you can feel stuck with no valuable answers and nowhere to go. Listen, I have a host of secrets and recipes that will not only help you enhance your lifestyle, career, relationships, and finances, but also help get your ass off the fence. And just because you're not where you want to be doesn't mean you're not where you're supposed to be. So let's go do the work. This episode starts now. Our guest tonight, at the age of 17, faced seven years in prison. And now he's on a mission to empower others to increase their self-value, improve their perception of their own worth, decrease the, the mental blocks, and design their lives through a mindset shift from scarcity to abundance and he's here and we're getting one-on-one with him right now you guys please welcome to off the fence mr javon wooden how you doing sir i'm doing well king how are you finch pleasure being on the show i appreciate you having me bro man it's a it's a pleasure to have you here um I thought I thought your story was very interesting. You, you talk to people a lot about overcoming self doubt, and I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure because most times we're we're looking at ourselves as how you know people always ask the question, how did you get to this point? How did you do that? And it's always filled. I I believe our lives are always filled with chapters that help us move to where we need to be in order for us to be able to assist other people and getting off the fence or getting off the boat and not sinking in the sand and becoming the true people that they were meant to be so i have to ask this question because at 17 you face seven years in prison now we don't have to get into right. your crime <laughs> but i want to get know, into it all bro i'm all good <laughs> okay, okay okay so we so there we have it, it. we can get into it all and because oftentimes people don't want to talk about their past. They feel like it's their past and they want to leave it there. I respect it. But um, yeah. when we talk about your life as as a man, and I, I'm going to assume if you're facing seven years, you committed a crime that warranted a jail sentence of some sort. So can, can we delve into that and talk about that a little bit uh, about what happened in your life at that time period and, and what caused you to be facing such a uh, harsh jail time? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I'm a firm believer that vulnerability is strength. So that's why I love to be transparent about my past, about everything that's going on with me. I think especially as black men, we have to have these conversations. It's the only way we're right, going to get right. past all the trauma, only way we're going to get past all the adversity and all that stuff. And the only way we're going to love ourselves and one another. Um, so, what happened was at 17, I had an assault and robbery charge. Now, whether it was as serious as the years made it sound to be or not, I don't know. Like, all I just know is, you know, I decided to take matters into my own hands. I was tired of being poor, tired of being broke, tired of having two pairs of shoes, two pairs of jeans for the jeans school year, tired of having five shirts to rotate through, you know. And I had, I've always worked, always worked as a kid mm -hmm. since like 14. But it just wasn't enough. Like my family was still in the hood. We still was in dilapidated housing where I didn't even want to bring my friends. And I was tired of it. So I was like, uh -huh. I got to do something. I have to do something. 
And prior to getting arrested, I had just gotten into like the whole robbing thing. And I used to, my mm-hmm. targets was drug dealers. Um, and I was like, okay, I, I rationalized drug dealers because I'm like, oh, they in the game. They not even like, I can't even see them as people. Like they, they just are targets. They targets that I should get. So I, I was rationalized by that because me, I found out later that that wasn't even, I wasn't even about that. Like I really right. was a compassionate kid. I really was a loving kid, but I let the environment dictate who I was versus my efforts. Um, and I was always a smart individual. I did well in school and all of that stuff, but there was a breaking point for me. You know, when mm-hmm. I seen my sisters uh, just struggling, right? They were younger than me, you know, and then my older sister was out of the house by then. Um, and I just had all these things, this anger pent up inside. My mom was always having to work. I rarely seen her, right? When we came home, mm-hmm. we had to call her and ask her like, hey, mom, what, what should we grab to eat? You know, stuff like that when uh-huh. I was younger. She wasn't there. So I got tired of it um, and it caught up to me. So I, I got caught up in February of like 2000, when was it? 2003, I think it was, um, I got mm-hmm. arrested. And I remember sitting in that jail cell, man, and I didn't care, to be honest. To be quite honest, I didn't, when I got locked up, I didn't even care. It did not hit me that this was real until my mom and my older sister came to visit me. Like later mm-hmm. on, like after I was in there for a few weeks, I had went to the floors and everything, you know, hopefully no one's experienced this, but you're in a holding cell for at least like a few days and then they move you to the floors, right? Strip you of your clothes, give you, you know, you're literally a prisoner at that point. Um, Mm -hmm. And when they visited me and I had to look them in their eyes and like see the pain that I had caused, like the people I actually cared about, because quite frankly, I didn't really, I didn't value myself at that time. Like Mm -hmm. I was just like, hey, I don't really care what happens to me as long as they can eat. And when they no longer cared about eating because they cared more so about visiting me and making sure I was okay, now I had a problem. Right Bro. now, it hit me. Now, when I went to the floors after that visit and after I had to talk to them and they telling me that it's okay, when I seen the tears well in their eyes, now I had to get a relationship with God because I would mm-hmm. pray. Right? I grew up in a Muslim household and we prayed five times a day, Ramadan fasted, all that stuff, but it didn't mean anything to me. It was empty. But this was the first time that I prayed and I actually meant the words I said to God. I actually understood what I was talking to him about when I asked him to give me another chance. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm going to tell you, bro, like that one, two weeks later, the prosecutors dropped the case because the victims had never showed. That was the wow. only reason why I got out, because the victims had never showed. And they said, okay, we held you enough time. Now, we've seen, and this was New York State, right? And we know how they did. Mm-hmm. We've seen Khalid Brower. We've seen these different things occur in right. New York State uh, jail cells and penitentiaries and stuff. So I got. I always say that God was there with me for sure. That was God's way of telling me, like, listen, this is not your path. You ain't about that life. <laughs> So get it together, young man, because you're destined to do more, and that's where it all started. <laughs> okay. So when, when when you when when people hear that, they may say, Javon, that's an excuse because you had other options. What would you say to mm-hmm. that? I would say, you know what? They're probably right, but when you're in it, you don't see other options, right? Mm-hmm. And that's why I became a coach because when someone's so into the fight, when they're into the adversity, when they're into the pain. All you feel is that pain. All you see is that opponent, right? And you're close. And it's just like any other coach. If you watch boxing, they have cornermen and all that stuff. Tell them what's happening because they can't see it, right? Right. Because they're right there in the fight. So I didn't have that. I didn't have someone telling me, yeah, you you need to do something else. All I knew was I had me, myself, and I, (laughs) right? And that's how I looked at it. Um, so, so yeah, that's, it sounds great. It sounds wonderful, but you, you know, when you're, when you're someone who's struggling as a lot of people, I'm sure who are listening, understand you don't feel that way. Right. And it took me a long time to get to the point where I was vulnerable enough. That's what it takes. It takes vulnerability, um, Mm -hmm. where I was vulnerable enough to say, I need help. Right. That was years later. Right. I got my relationship with God. I asked him for help and he gave it to me. But it was years later until I could ask a human for help. Um, and that wasn't until 2017, really, 
after my first uh, deployment to Afghanistan when I came back. Okay. So, so what would you say to, in in, in this aspect, you're saying of uh, uh, the many years that transpired between the time you your crime was committed and you was facing this mm-hmm. this time till you was able to ask a human for help. Why do you think that was? Why would you think that time period was so vast for you? It was so vast because, um, you know, as a young black man, uh, when you hear, you hear a lot about what a young black man is supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, and especially when you don't have that that father who's teaching you what it means to be a man in general. Uh, okay. You're learning these things as you go, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's There's no manual that says, hey, a man needs to do this, and this is what you do if you come from the hood. This is what you do if you come from adverse situations to make it and to get some money, to get a good job. You know, There's no manual that says that. And even if there was, it might not work for you because your path is different. Um, and I yeah. had to understand that. Um, so it took me a while to understand my value. Because if you can't see and you don't love yourself, if you don't have value and a, a perception, a positive self-perception, all you focus on is the negatives. And that's what mm-hmm. I was focused on. I was focused on how things weren't going my way. And when you're doing that, you have confirmation bias. So no matter how, if something good happens for a while, that one bad thing that takes place completely derails you. And now you're back in a depressed state. Now you're back Mm -hmm. wondering like why and all these other things. And that's what I was doing. So um, it took me a while to figure that out. It took me a while to see like, hey, you have, you know, you don't have to wait for opportunities. You can create opportunities, right? You know, people don't have to give you something. You know, when people tell you, you look like you should be on a street corner, you don't look like you'd be doing this well, that doesn't mean anything to you, right? Like those mm-hmm. opinions don't matter because if you have a positive opinion of what you're capable of, then we can work. Then we can start doing things. But I didn't have mm-hmm. that at the time. And that's why it took me a while. It took me a while to get to that point. And, and you were 17 at that time, correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so when you look at life now versus then, and because I heard, I heard you talk about, you know, not having a father and the manual not being there. And I think that's right. a lot of times people are on the fence when it comes to the choices. And, you know, we hear this all the time, especially in this day and age with social media, um, <laughs> w- where you have people... <laughs> They, they say it's a uh, shift blaming. Uh, they're blaming life and circumstances and a host of other things on everything except for the choices that they chose to make. Would you say right. you fall in that category back then versus now? Um, I, w- I would say this, um, and that's a great question, by the way, Finch. Uh, I would say that when people say that, that's a privileged perspective. Ah, because. Okay. If, if you have the privilege of the outside looking in, it's easy to say that. But when you're going through it, you feel hopeless, you feel helpless. It's not that easy, right? Mm-hmm. If you tell a single mom who's struggling to go to school and pay for ends meet that she's shift blaming, she might smack you, right? <laughs> because you're not in her shoes, so you don't really understand. So I would never say that someone who's going through the struggle is blaming other things, Right. I would never say that. I would say that um, when you're going through it, it's really important to find your why. What drives oh. you to be better? You I would say it's. Come on now. Yeah. I would, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I would say it's really important to find reasons to change your circumstances instead of excuses right. to stay the same. And that's yep. the differentiation. Right. Um, that's the important factor. And that's why mindset plays so much into this. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm glad you said that about finding your why, because I tell people that all the time. Mm-hmm. Down to everything you do in life, if you can locate the why, if you're afraid, that, and that's part of the reason why we do this this uh, podcast, because we don't want people to be on the fence about anything right. in their life, whether that be careers, relationship, finances, uh, their purpose, whatever it is. It's like finding out the why. And I think oftentimes people never look at the fact that, okay, why am I afraid? Why am I hesitant? Mm-hmm. Why do I continuously choose the same man, the same woman, and then complain about the type of people I'm getting? Why am I right. making the decisions that are not pushing me closer to my destiny, but bringing me further back and sinking me down 
it, 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 it literally it becomes an anchor. And so I think finding that why is so vitally important to whether or not you advance or whether or not you stay the same, whether, whether you excel or you just stay mediocre. Your why right. is vitally important. And I, I hope people get that from all the lessons that you're teaching them, because that's that's one of the biggest things, I think, in overcoming self-doubt, you know, because when you look For at sure. self-doubt, what is what is step down? That's us looking at ourselves and not believing in us, not believing we can do the things that we either have the capabilities of doing, the talent to do, or the know-how to do. And today, people call that imposter syndrome. Um, and it's one of those things where I always look at, and I think everybody, if if, we, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, everybody at some point in their life have dealt with self-doubt. Everybody. For sure. Everybody, sure. uh, including myself, de has dealt with self-doubt. But at the end of the day, I think one of the things I love about what you teach people is how do you move from where you are in doubting yourself to designing a life you don't need a vacation from? Because think about this. How many people you know every Monday they dread going to work? Right. And I always right. tell people it's because right. you're not living on purpose. You're just working. You're just doing a task. You're just doing what there they call a job. You there know you what I'm go. saying? And at the end of the day, if you're living on purpose, every day is Friday to you. That's how I think about it. Nah, I love that, man. I love that. Every day is Friday because, you know, when you, you mentioned a key word, which is purpose. And we are mm -hmm. purpose driven beings, right? That's human nature. And I also want to point it out that self doubt isn't inherently bad, right? If right. you think about it, in bad and good, that's a concept, it's a construct. So there's typically two, both of those are typically in whatever situation, no matter how dire it looks. Um, you, but um, when you think about purpose, a lot of us are walking around, we forgot what it was or we never knew, right? We've right. been so goal oriented orienting on goals that don't align with us that right. we have no joy anymore we we are a ship sailing without a destination so we're lost yep. um <laughs> and that's because we don't really take that time to do that introspection we don't take time to do that work like it it is not always easy some of us we have many passions we have many things we enjoy doing we have mm -hmm. you know whatever but at some point along the way people tend to lose themselves Right. Yep. They tend to lose yep. themselves because of the pressures of society, because of the pressures of, you know, maybe they're people pleasers, whatever it is. Someone told them that they couldn't in the past and now they not, haven't gotten over. But that's why it's so important to have people around you, whether it's professionals, friends, family, people around you who challenge you, who allow you to be empowered, feel empowered, allow you to grow. Um, we are not meant to do things alone. That's just not how we were designed. Uh, we are designed to have social constructs. I, I always say like 360 support because in the uh -huh. military, we talk about 360 security, right? We talk yep. about having a, a cordon off on whatever the asset is to protect it, to make sure no harm can come its way, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing I, I challenge my, my clients to do in life is to do that 360 security, but it starts within, right? Yep. When you understand that opinions can really only bother you if you let it. No Ooh. one can get you out of character. No one can yep. make you do something unless it's a life-threatening situation. So right. we have to start taking that accountability. And that way, when we hold ourselves accountable, now we can start looking at other people who challenge us to be better, um, empower us, and are doing things to inspire us and all the other things. And now you form that 360 security. And now you are doing very well in life. And that's what it yeah. took me, right? It took me yeah. to find those people that challenged me and weren't pulling me to say, you know, you can sell this pack and get some quick money, right? Or whatever <laughs> it was, right? Yeah. And it, that's, that's just being serious, man. It's yeah. like, you know, that's what it is. When we, when we allow ourselves to get sucked in and it's, you know, you mentioned the point you were talking about, you know, excuses and all that stuff, like people staying and into what's familiar. And mm -hmm. that's where it, it takes a lot to get out of that because it's a mindset change, right? Yep. So many of us are, are rooted in like scarcity and lack. And we just have this comp competitive mindset 
and where in that competitive mindset may not lead to us being competitors for what we're trying to achieve. It may lead to us being defensive because now we're mm. thinking everyone's coming for us. Everyone right. has it out for us. Right. And we don't want to get close to this person. We don't want to tell them our ideas. It's the exact opposite for me now. Now, mm. instead of competing, I want to collaborate because I understand that when I share my ideas, I can find someone who may have skills or uh, a perspective that I wouldn't have had. And now it makes me better. It makes us better as a unit. And that's where, you know, a lot of us get stuck. That fear of someone hurting us. Well, that's vulnerability comes in there, right? Vulnerability is allows for serendipity. If you open yourself up to allow to learn, to love, and to live, now beautiful things can happen for you. But when you close yourself off, all you do is cause yourself to be in this bubble. And when you're in this bubble, you can't really see what's going on. You're looking through a lens of fear and negativity Mm -hmm. in that bubble, right? You know, so that's what happens. And and now you can't grow. You can't grow. You're comfortable, but it's artificial, right? There is really... You're, you're comfortable because you know what it is, right? That's like when people are in bad relationships, they just know the devil they're with, right? And that's what happens. And that happens in life. And then next thing you know, 50 years has passed you and you've done the same job. You've made the same money. You've lived check to check your whole life, whatever it is. And that's how it takes place. Yeah. Now, Javon, you don't use the college word and the people studying to get their GED <laughs> is like, what does serendipity mean? You know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no problem. So I so I, I kind of touched on it. It's just being able to allow beautiful things to happen in life. It's like things that wouldn't happen otherwise if you didn't open yourself up to the world, right? If you didn't mm-hmm. allow things to happen, if you try to control every single little thing, even though you can't, right? right. That's what that's then you don't experience that beauty. Yeah. I tell people all the time, you can only change that in which you control. If it is right. out of your control, you cannot change it. So why worry about it? Why exhaust time in it? Because you can't change it. You got to focus on mm-hmm. changing the very things that you personally have control over. And most time that's you. That's your mindset. And so I want to ask you this. How does one overcome self-doubt? What are, what are three things that you would tell a person that's dealing with a battling with self-doubt right now? And they say, hey. I wanted to design the life that I don't need a vacation from. So what's the what's the one thing I have to do first? Because, you know, people always want these steps because oftentimes we're stuck in quicksand and all of our ideas and thought processes have not worked for us. And that's why we're so frustrated. So when someone comes along with some fresh water and they give you a drink and you say, hey, let drink from this and you will not thirst again. So. What are three things that people can utilize right now in their lives to help them overcome the self-doubt that they battle with every day? Good question. So I'm going to start with what you can do individually. Right. So the first thing you can do is forgive yourself. Right. Uh-huh. Forgive yourself for all the times you look back and said, I would have, could have, should have, because you can no longer do anything for that. The past is only to inform, but it's not to dictate and rule you. You don't live there. Right. You got to come back to the present. So you got to forgive yourself. Start with a clean slate. The second is believe in you. Believe that what you dreamed or what you thought of is possible, because if you believe it, you'll do the work necessary to make it so. And mm-hmm. then the third thing is really challenge yourself. You know, if you if you stay in that little comfort zone of what you do, you're never going to step forward. Right. Your steps are going to be like this versus leaps. Right. So you got to really challenge yourself. It doesn't have to be like this big, gigantic challenge. It could be starting off small, but you have to build that success muscle. So if I challenge myself, say I wanted a new job, I'm tired of working wherever I'm working. Maybe I'll go on LinkedIn and I see a recruiter for a company I wanted to work with. That challenge could be hitting that recruiter up. Right. Right. Just finding, you know, putting in that work, whatever it is. But start small and just keep building on it. Each day, challenge yourself to do something different, something that you feel those little butterflies, but you know Mm. will move you forward closer to who you want to be. That's another thing. I'm going to give a bonus. Don't focus on who you are. Focus on who you want to be. Act as that person. Think as that person. Ask yourself, what would they do? You know, and that's going to help you move forward. 
Because when you imagine things and you visualize the success, you can reverse engineer everything. You can work backwards for that. Like, what did I see when I was that person? How were they living? You know, who was around them? All these different things. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you another question, but first I'm going to bring in my friends. Uh, JB and Nate are here with us right now. Uh, What's going on, Kings? You guys have What's up, Bill? What's right. up, what's up? So, so Javon, I got this. I got another question for you. When when people when someone is sitting idle and they're thinking, when you said believe in yourself, and they had so many times where they have believed in themselves and things mm -hmm. did work out, and so they is we all know it, it has chiseled at their confidence, so they're no longer confident and believing in themselves. What tip would you give them how to get off that fence and get back in the game and and, and really? Uh, get over where they are and, and that life hurdle so that they can move forward. Yeah. I mean, w one of the things I said earlier, realize you don't have to do it by yourself, right? Mm. If you struggle, if you have issues, if you always cop out or whatever it is, find someone, find someone who aligns. They are doing some things. Maybe you like to see them. They're inspiring you, whatever it is, find them and, and find a bunch of them. Like don't, not just one. Find a couple of them. And I talked about that 360 support system. You got to have people around you, right? There's always times, including me as a mindset coach, that I'm like, damn, how do I get this done, right? But don't mm -hmm. focus so much on the how. Just focus on the what. What do I want? And then just start taking those steps. You don't have to know everything that's going on, especially when you have some people with you that's going to help you when your, your belief is waning in yourself. And that's that's that would be the one most important point I would say. Okay. Now I can get more if y'all want them, but I I, I want people <laughs> to start with that. <laughs> Nate JB, y'all got questions? Yeah, man, I, I'm I'm really enjoying the conversation, man. Um, uh, I had two questions for you. Um, earlier you were talking about uh value and how important it is mm -hmm. to discover that self value. Uh, what kind of advice would you give? to uh, someone who's struggling to find that value within themselves? That's a great question, JB. Uh, one, change how you're speaking to yourself. So we hear it all the time, like positive language and positive action, right? So if, if I'm speaking to myself positively, no matter what, you can reframe almost anything you're saying to yourself. So if I say I suck, I'm going to start believing that. But mm -hmm. if I say, all right, um, I'm not as efficient as I want to be. How can I get better? Then I can take the action, right? And I can still work off of that. So you have to really speak to yourself in a positive manner. Um, another thing I would say, again, the support, right? Make sure you have people who are not downing you, belittling you, making you feel less than, because no, that that's not that shouldn't even be a thing, to be honest. Like if someone has constructive criticism, they should say it in a way that's not, uh, they should say it with tact. Pretty much. They just say it in a way that's not taking you down and, and, and deconstructing you from where you are. And then the third thing is practice gratitude. You really have to practice gratitude, not just for God, but to yourself. So every day I wake up before I even open my eyes, I just thank God and I thank myself for getting me as far as I can get right so far. And you have to do that. Look in the mirror. Tell yourself you love yourself. Tell yourself, yo, I appreciate how far we've come. I know we still have some work to do, whatever it is. Be honest, but show that love. Because when you forget to celebrate you, you forget all the things that you've gone through. Now it just seems like a struggle. Now it's like it, you don't appreciate what you've done so far. And it's really hard to continue to build off a shaky foundation. Yeah, that's good stuff. Good stuff. And you know, um, I say this too, um, Javon. I, I don't believe in uh, constructive uh, criticism. Uh, number one reason why. Reason being is because let me hear this one. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> why, why you? Why are you looking like that, JB? Because <laughs> I know. Cause I know you. Yep. <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting on this one myself. <laughs> 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 See, see, oftentimes when people are giving you what they coin as constructive criticism, it's really cr criticism constructed to belittle you and to it, it, because people have this idea of what the criticism looks like. I believe in constructive feedback because the feedback mm -hmm. is is helping you. The feedback keeps you empowered. 
the criticism is the thing that that dejects you as a person because it's going to be mostly filled because of what we've been taught about the definition of criticism. It's going to be filled with mm -hmm. mostly negative words, which impacts the mindset of people, right? So if you give constructive feedback, that feedback is laced with wisdom. It also houses uh, uh, empowerment and it allows mm -hmm. you to leave the conversation feeling like, oh man, I can, I can be better. Just like you just talk about what you tell yourself. I can now be better because I received some constructive feedback from someone who actually loves me and want to see me win. Constructive criticism mm -hmm. normally comes from people who don't want to see you win. So that's why I don't believe in it. Okay. Well said. I like that. So, so well said. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> so, so we not. Yeah. I like, I like how you said that. I like how you yeah. said that. I, I can agree with that. Yeah, but when you think about our world and how we function, we talked about this last week, guys. A lot of what we do and how we operate is centered around what we've been taught. So how we define terms, words, actions is all centered around what somebody else told us it should mean. When we start taking back, now, Javon, you talked about God. Now, I don't know which mm -hmm. God you're referring to because you, mm -hmm. you didn't specify. And I know in this world we live in, there's a host of gods that people serve. But when we talk about the God of the, the universe, per se, um, when we look at how he operates and how he constructs things, it's not the same way in which we've been taught. So that's why when I look at words like criticism, and I look at how society uses that. That's normally mm -hmm. it, even with that word they call rebuke. That's another form of criticism, but it's deemed to hurt you and if it if criticism or or rebuke doesn't restore you then it's just abuse so that's why that's why i look at words and terms and actions from a different viewpoint because i've grown over the years i've gotten a lot wiser and i realize even in myself which is how and like you javon how i was able to change is i gotta redefine how i have how i have seen the life i have and how i'm living the life i have if I want a different life, mm -hmm. I just got to redefine it because if right. I'm going by the definitions I've been taught my whole life, I have been taught erroneously. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah. that's that's a great point uh, that you mentioned, Finch, and that's that's really why you know I'm I'm not afraid to use that word criticism, right? Because in vulnerability, right? If you think about these two words, they have negative connotations, right? Uh -huh. And a word, as we know, we can shape it to be what we want it to be if you look at just about any word right so vulnerability also had that negative connotation but when i speak about vulnerability i'm not talking about naivety i'm not talking about being you know blind to what you're seeing i'm talking about opening yourself up and also with criticism right i i love your definition i love how you changed it to feedback um because that's actually what i was saying when i was referring to it so i appreciate you you know really doing that that molding and, and using the word feedback. So I like how you did that, man. That was good. <laughs> yeah, because, because to be honest, um, you know, a lot of these words people are afraid to say, right. And that's why I like to use certain words because we have given them these, these negative things and people hear them and they're like, Ooh, now they become taboo. So I, I really work towards taking words that people do not like, that maybe give some people like, oh man, he said that word. I want to take those and make them positive, right? That's because good. I think that um, all of us, you know, we need to get over that, you know, especially in a black community. Like there's certain words that hit us and we're like, nah, you know, I, I ain't listening to this man no more. And that's what I want to do. I want to change that where we don't have that, where we can talk about anything and we can use any words and people can go ahead and give their voice freely as we're doing on this platform. Right. Nate, you got a question? I do. <clears throat> well, first of all, I want to say thank you for your service. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the support. Army, right? Yes, it, yes, sir. Did NCO? you serve? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yep, you served. <laughs> yep, NCO. Yes, sir. I did not want to go to that officer side. Too many politics. <laughs> 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 I, I went to the dark side, so oh. it is what it is. <laughs> but, but 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 what's your MOS? Twenty five Bravo, information technology specialist. How about really? you? 
Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm rebranching to 26 Alpha. 26 uh, Alpha. Tell me, remind me what that is. That's a systems engineer. Okay. It's actually oh, a new. Might, yeah. It's actually a. It's a new discipline that the uh, Signal Core created. Because you awesome. know we're getting into all of this uh, cyber warfare now. Yeah, and I that's started out logistics, but yeah, so now I'm switching up. So maybe I'll see you downrange somewhere. But here's my question <laughs> for you: <laughs> When you talk about that aha moment with your mom and your sister uh, seeing you and breaking down, and that's when you realize. If I get another chance, I'll make a change. And it's easy to tell people, change your mindset or, or think positively or mm -hmm. reframe your reality in order to make a change. But truth is, everybody's walk is different. And you say For that sure. you are a coach. So what I would like to know is, out of the other people who you have coached or mentored, what was some of their uh, success stories like in terms of that triggering moment where that the light bulb went off and they're like, okay, I'm ready to make that change? Yeah, for sure. And thank you for asking that question. And that is so true. And that's why, um, you know, I like to come to coaching sessions with a blank slate. Like, I don't want a preconceived notion. I don't want to think I have the solution for them or anything. I like to listen to them first. Um, some of the, the most effective changes that I've seen from my clients, uh, one was a fellow service member. You know, he was really going through it with his job. Like he didn't have, a good, you know, a grasp of career. His marriage was on the rocks. Um, his kids, you know, he was, he was in the, the midst of losing his children. And, you know, it was all due to like the, the stress, the trauma that he had experienced not just in the military, but prior to the military, you know, being abused as a child, all these other things. And, you know, we worked together and being able to see that transformation where he was able to believe in himself enough and, and realize that he actually had the skills. We do like strength assessments and all types of stuff. So he was able to see that he actually had what it took to get some of the positions that he was looking at that he thought were like not in, in his reach. Um, and then he was able to communicate effectively and learn emotional intelligence over our time so he could rebuild his marriage, learn how to um, not lash out, learn how to think before he spoke, learn how to do things that was romantic to build his relationship, um, all these different things. And that was one of the biggest transformations I've seen. Um, then I've had clients where maybe um, like, for instance, I had one gentleman who was retiring right from the education space. And he had uh, lost his mother shortly before his retirement. And his sister, who he used to be close with, they just completely, over the, the course of their mother dying, they just lost their connection. And we had to go through a, a, a few exercises to realize what was really important to him. Like his mother was his life. Like he was retiring actually to travel the world with his mom and do all these different things with her. So when he lost her, he lost his purpose. So we had to go ahead and find out what really mattered to him. What was the symbol of his mother? You know, what what did that symbolize being able to travel and do all these things with her? Um, you know, why did him and his sister break down? All these different things so we can build a, a action plan to help him rebuild that relationship, rebuild his purpose and find his purpose and then identify how he was actually going to do it. Um, and I can give more case studies, but I think the important part of it is, is yes, it's tough to change your mindset. Yes, it's tough to change, to get emotional intelligence. Yes, it's tough to face the traumas and all that other stuff <clears throat> that comes along with it. But when you have someone and we have a couple people with support system, one of the first things we do is identify a couple people who can work as they're growing. Um, it's possible, right? And the first thing you have to do is get to the point where you can believe that. Because if you don't believe that these things are possible, you're going to do the work and you'll be like, ah, man, I'm done. Like, that was nothing. I ain't even work. What is that? So that's one of the first criteria. Like, in the contracts of people who sign up for me and all these things, the first thing I say is come in with the belief that things are possible. Because if you do not, not nothing will work for you. I don't care 
what's going on. Nothing will work for you and you will never be able to see the success that you're obtaining in your journey. Mm. I got one last question for you before we let you out of here. And you're right. That was powerful. You just mentioned about mindset being hard to change. Why do you think that mm -hmm. is for, for a lot of people? Why is it so hard for us to change how we think? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a few reasons. Well, one of the things is um, a lot of these things come from when we're impressionable, which is as young children and things like that. And when they become unaddressed, they build. And they manifest mm -hmm. in different ways um, because you think that it's all good. You think you're grown now and you're past it. But that thing, that stuff stays with you if you never address it. And as many of us never do. Right. We never seek therapy. We never seek coaching. We never seek counseling. We never seek any of those things until it becomes reactive instead of proactive. If we could get it where we shift these things left and make it so they're proactive, where we're building, we're doing the work prior to where we feel like we can't handle it anymore, it will make things so much better for us, so much easier. It will make the path much clearer for us. Um, another reason mindset is hard to change is because things are ingrained in us. We are getting information from everywhere, everywhere. And a lot of it is negative, quite frankly. If you look on social media, if you're not um, adjusting your feed to be feeding you instead of detracting from you, you're getting all that energy, even if you don't think so. You're watching these people get killed. You're watching these people getting beat up. You're watching all these things, and it impacts you. Energy is transferable. No matter if you think it's hurting you or not, it, it, it affects you, right? So that's important. It's important to change how you're ingesting this information and what how you're processing it, because if you're not careful, those things are starting to load up in your mind, in your mind's eye. Um, another thing is... People really don't take the time to learn how to be mindful, which is aware of your thoughts, aware of how you're doing things, um, aware of, you know, what you're saying to yourself, just aware, right? Mm. Instead of living in the moment, people are so focused on the past or the present, and that's really impacting you. I myself, you know, I've struggled with depression over the years, and mm. Lao Tzu said it best, <laughs> if you focus on the past, that's where you experience depression. If you focus on the future, that's where you experience anxiety. If you focus on the present, that's where you can find happiness. And that's what I've started really focusing on is the present. Like you said earlier, what you can change, yep. right? What you can change because mindset is, is it comes into play on everything. But if you never pay attention to what you're saying and how you're setting yourself up, you can't change that mindset. Man, that's good. I'm going to ask you one last question. And I'm, I'm truly going to ask you one last question. <laughs> <laughs> so good, man. I'm enjoying the combo, man. You can't just do a great conversation, great. man. I, I, um, I actually got one, two things. So okay. You, me you too. ask yours first, and then I, I ask mine next. Okay. Yeah. Um, my question was, and you kind of touched on it earlier, and I know for me, it, uh, it, it, it rung true for me as well. And I just wanted to just get your perspective real quick, Juwan. Um, why do you think it's so difficult as black men mm. that we have such trouble asking other other men for help where do you think that comes from yeah that's a great right question now. man that's a great question well i mean we have a violent history against us one right and trauma is not just on you it's generational so mm. you carry that in your in your x and y chromosomes right whatever your ancestors have been through is carried with you in some way and then if you think about how we've been separation, separated from our families and denigrated over the years, that plays into a, a effect, right? So when people say the angry black man, well, yeah, we have reason to be angry and upset and defensive. Absolutely. But yeah, so it takes us more time to realize how to express those emotions because we've always been told to suppress instead of express, right? right. So we've, we're taught, hey, if you cry, you weak, you know, if you if you say show anything other than like anger and strength, right, you're weak, right? So we have to get these things. Or when in slavery times and all those other times, we were told you can't show anything except what that person wants you to show, right? Which W.E.B. Du Bois called the souls of black folks, right? When he talked about the, the different souls and the different faces we had to show. But that is why it's so tough for black men. And that is why it's so important for us to have conversations like this, where we're expressing our opinions, we're expressing things we've gone through, we're expressing our different ideas and ideologies about how we get over all these things. 
it just we just have to keep having those conversations over and over again and um and, and we you know i don't i don't like to use the term safe space but we have to have spaces where we can express right where we feel mm-hmm. like our our uh we're not going to be denigrated again right especially mm-hmm. by our own people mm-hmm. i gotta ask you uh, now i got two questions <laughs> <laughs> let me let me get mine in before you turn into Dr. V. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> All right, Jay, Javon. Um, in listening to you, I've heard a lot of good material, a lot of good mm-hmm. content. And for our listening audience who might also be curious, can you actually share the trainings and credentials and basically your I don't know if qualifications is a good word to say, but basically your credentials as a therapist so mm-hmm. that people can understand exactly what they're getting when they come to you for help. Right. Well, first and foremost, I'm not a therapist, right? Um, I am a coach. Um, and the difference is therapists, uh, one, they're regulated field. They have to go to school for all these things and everything. And therapists tend to focus from the past to the present. Um, I am a coach, which I focus on the, the present to the future, getting you from where you are to where you want to be. Uh, the certifications I've received, um, I went through a program called International Coaching Academy. Everything I've done is aligned with um, an organization called International Coaching Federation. If you go to a coach and they haven't been accredited because it's not a regulated field, then they probably haven't gone through that training, right? Um, everything is usually geared towards International Coaching Federation. So I've gotten my power empowered lifestyle coaching certification. I've gotten my uh, rational emotive behavioral therapy coaching certification. I've gotten my mindset coaching therapist, uh, mindset coaching certification. I've gotten all these certifications. Uh, But the point is I'm doing the work so I can show my my clients and others who aren't my clients. I just want to be able to speak to everyone, right? I want to be able to help all of us get success. But the point is that I'm always continuing my education so that I'm not just talking out of nowhere, right? I know exactly what I'm saying through my experiences, but I also know exactly what I'm saying through informed education. Now, you know what, Nate? Now, I'm not Yo. saying this to you personally, Nate, but I'm I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this because this goes back to what I said earlier. That's another okay. thing I think as a society, we have to rid our minds of. I think that's a mindset change too, um, is we feel like if, if somebody hasn't said somebody is certified to do X, Y, Z, that they're not qualified to do it. And in essence, I, th- I think, I think, and again, cause this is my show, I can say this word. I think it's bullshit for one, because if somebody gives you stuff that helps you become a better person, no matter if they went to a school. I, and again, see, I'm one of those people because I've traveled around the country. I don't have no certifications in nothing. Uh, but I've spoken to thousands of people from Peru to Israel and everything I tell people, it works for them. And I said this, I say this now because I remember there was a time where I was approached by somebody uh, about a degree. I flunked out of college. At the end of the day, I'm going to tell you where I learned this from. My good friend, Hill Harper. Y'all know what he taught me? We was on tour together in 2008. Uh, it was called the HBCU Empower Me Tour. Um, brought on by UNCF and the Wachovia Foundation at the time. It's now called the Wells Fargo uh, Foundation. But he said to me, he said, people go to school to learn how to work for other people. And at the end of the day, you don't need school. But in our society, if you don't have some letters behind your name or some plaque on the wall, we discount your advice or your expertise because of what we was talking about earlier, the mindset that has been betrothed upon us by society. And in essence, that that very person can have a host of things that you can use to change your entire life, your bank account, your career. But because of how we view things in our society, it's all surrounded around somebody saying you're good enough to do it or you know what? We validate you. And so... I don't I don't subscribe to that because at the end of the day, I've made a lot of money uh, without a degree and without certifications in a host of things that people. Now, I'm not a I'm not a coach. Uh, 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 
let me co- correct that. I'm not considered a life coach, but I have coached, and I'm not exaggerating. I'm not padding these stats. I have coached thousands of people from big name celebrities down to everyday average Joe, and all of the things I've ever given them has worked for them in their lives. Well, the best thing you can learn from is life, right? Um, that's the best teacher. Life is the best teacher. So, you know, well, I say OJT, right? On the job training. On the job learn training. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah. And that's how it is. But um, for me, like the certifications in the schooling, like, you know, all the, the schooling I've done was really a personal thing for me uh, because I know what our ancestors had gone through for us to be able to do these things. I just wanted to learn. And I'm a very curious individual. And what all these certifications and MBAs and all this, uh, it it gave me the structured approach where I'm not going because I will go down a rabbit hole. I, I'm just that curious. I'll go on YouTube and I'll be watching videos for hours. Like, damn, how much time did I spend on it? You know, but that's that's really what it is, man. It's just about being curious and me being appreciative because at one point, you know, when I was about to lose my freedom, I really was like, damn, I just threw away everything. So now yeah. that I know that I have all these things at my fingertips. I want it all, right? I want to embrace it, and then I want to share it when I do get it. So one last question for you, Javon. What would you say you're currently on the fence about in your life and how you plan to get off of? <laughs> what am I currently on the fence about in my life? Um, Man, a lot. Ah. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think being on the fence is just a, a part of the healing journey, man. Like, you know, I, I still go to therapy regularly, and one of the things I'm on the fence about is uh, my past. Like, am I am I truly, truly healed through all the work I've done at this point, or does it still come back and manifest in different ways? And that's one of the things I'm on the fence about. Um, and I always say healing is a journey that never ends, right? It's an ongoing thing. It's a distal goal that we look at. And we're always going to be searching for it. Um, so that's what I'm on the fence about. Hey, thanks for tuning in. Be sure to give us a follow, rate us, and leave a comment because we love to hear your thoughts. And until next time, get your ass off the fence.